All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week, we're going to do something a little bit different. We've got a Rastar Land Rover Defender. It's a toy class RC, albeit a fairly made one. Now, you might be asking why we're looking at it here on RC Mojo. Well, if we look at the top corner of the box, we see it's 114th scale. That's the same scale as the Tamiya and Hercules lorries. It's a fairly rare scale to find, 112th and 116th being far more common. Rastar also make various sporty cars in 114th, along with a rather nice Range Rover you often see modified with police lights. They're only rear-wheel drive with very limited suspension, so they're no good at all off-road, but on the fairly flat truck layouts they scoot around quite nicely. Anyway, as with most toy trucks, it's packaged up to look rather nice on a shop shelf. On the bottom of the box we have lots of important information, no doubts there's warnings of fatal injury if you don't read it and follow the instructions. One thing that does stand out though, the truck and the radio both use double A's, not the old PP39 volt that only ever lasted a couple of hours. Much better than the old days. Once the internal packaging is slid from the box, we find the truck and radio are well and truly attached to the cardboard. They've actually screwed them on. That's some fairly extreme packaging. I suppose they really want to make sure that the bits won't fall about in the box during shipping. The radio isn't too bad to remove with just two screws. The truck though uses four screws, but they come out easy enough. But then we find the back door is still well and truly anchored. Turns out there's another bit of plastic that wraps around the back door hinges. To remove it, we have to cut away some tape on the bottom of the box. The little plastic tab that sticks through is very easy to miss. Push it through and untangle it from the back door, then the truck should lift free from the box. There's probably something in the manual about getting it out of the box, but that wouldn't be any fun, would it? So, the model. All the doors are hinged, the front doors close up fairly nicely and clip shut. The tops of the door frames do rub a little bit, so you have to give them an extra little press to make them sit right, but that's not a big problem. The back door, though, is a bit more of an issue. The spare wheel turns to open and close a locking pin. Unfortunately, the door doesn't quite close so the pin won't latch. If we'd bought the truck to use as is, or even as a gift, I'd be a bit disappointed. But since we're going to be taking it apart anyway, it shouldn't matter too much. There's a full and detailed interior. It's all black, so it's hard to see on camera, but it's all there. It does look rather good. The suspension is functional. If you ever had a Mardave mini stocks, you'll know how it works. The entire gearbox is sprung at the back, and the front hubs can slide up and down. Quite a neat and simple method, but the springs are a bit stiff. I can't see them having enough give for the suspension to do anything while driving around at all. Quite amazingly for a toy truck, the gearbox has a fully working differential. For smooth track use, that's going to greatly improve the turning circle. I was totally expecting a straight through axle. I suppose, before we see what's inside, we should probably power it up and see where we're starting from. The transmitter's going to need its antenna fitting. It's just a little telescopic jobby that screws into the top of the radio. On the back there's a battery cover, under which we install two double A's. The radio is buttons only, so bang bang controls. Also, it doesn't have a power switch. Unlike our hobby grade radios, most toy radios only transmit when a button is pressed. Very simple and very crude, but for what it's doing, it's just about good enough. The bottom of the truck has another battery cover. This time it's hinged, so you can't lose it. We install five double A's, close the door and turn it on. Well, the steering sort of works. You can hear a motor spinning when one of the buttons is pressed. The system works by spinning a small motor one way or the other to drive the steering through a small clutch. When the motor stops spinning, there's a scissor spring that centres the wheels. Again, like the radio, it's all a bit crude. Going forwards and backwards, we hear it doesn't have a vast amount of torque, and obviously no brakes. I think with the combination of the steering and throttle control used as intended, it would be bouncing off all of the skirting boards. The truck does have some nice working lights, which is a bit of a bonus. The headlights come on when the motor's running forwards and slowly fade out when it's spinning down. It's almost acceptable, if a little bit strange. The rear lights are really crazy though. When we drive in reverse, the fog light and reversing light light up red, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. If the red LEDs came on with the headlights, it would be halfway there, 
or if the reversing light came on in reverse. But there we go. As is often the case with these nice little features, there has to be something bizarre to keep a proper balance. I think they probably would have done better just having the lights come on with the power switch and not bother trying to control them. A simpler setup and would avoid all the strange behaviour. With the batteries popped out, you can start taking it apart. Like most toys, there's an awful lot of screws holding it together. They should be designed to take the abuse of a small child and not eject all the small parts. There's two screws at the front, one in the middle at the back, along with two at the rear of the sills. And I didn't see them at first, there's another pair in the rear wheel arches, along with two more at the front of the sills. They all come out easy enough. The ones on the rear arches are a bit fiddly to get at, and you have to kind of squash the tyre a bit to get a good grip on the screw head. It might be a little bit easier if you pull the tyres off first, but it's doable either way. Now with a bit of jiggling, the two halves should separate. There's a bunch of wires going between the chassis and the body, none of which we really need for this project. There's a 40 meg antenna that quite neatly runs up a channel in the window moulding, and a lot of wires for the LEDs. We don't need any of the electronics on the chassis, all we'll be keeping is the motor and possibly the switch. So to make things easier, we're just going to cut the wires at the PCB. We might end up keeping the headlight LEDs. It does depend on how well glued in they are. The taillight LEDs can go though. They're not even pointing at the right lenses. Inside the body, we have lots of bits to remove. But first, I have to point out what looks a lot like a small speaker mount on the bottom of the interior. It looks like there might have been a variant with sound. Although a speaker that size would only really be good for a horn, there wouldn't be enough bass for much else. To remove the interior, we need to remove lots more screws. First at the front, there's two screws on each side that attach the blocks that make up the bottom of the door hinges. The blocks won't come out yet though, as they're held on by the door part of the hinges at the sides of the interior. We need to take the two screws out that directly attach the interior to the body just below the windscreen. Now with the doors open, we can flex the body outwards a little and lift the interior. The block should either pop out, or at the very least, they should come loose so you can lift them out. At the back of the body, we need to remove the screw that mounts the fuel filler. If you leave it in, it gets in the way of getting the interior out. There's two more screws right at the back corners that need to come out too, which just leaves the rear door. We need to be able to swing the hinge right inside the body so to do that, we need to remove the door card. It's held on with four small screws, which are nice and easy to remove, but watch out for the scissor spring inside. It has a tendency to pop out as you take the door card away. Now we can close the hinge as far in as it will go and start to remove the interior. You have to bend the sides of the body quite a bit to get the interior panel to clear. Just don't overdo it. As you start to lift the interior, the doors will find their way out. Keep an eye out for the hinge pins though, they do like to fall out. Looking back though, it probably would have been a bit easier to pull the pins out and remove the doors as soon as the blocks were removed. Here's the interior then. It's got forward facing rear seats rather than the old sideways benches, as well as the later dashboard. Now, while I'd rather have the earlier look, you can't really complain about the amount of detail. If you got in there and really went mad with the detailing, it would be fairly straightforward to get it up to static model levels. Now, I'm not going to take any more of the body apart, I really just wanted to check how easy it would be to paint. And other than those white mounting lugs, everything is either screwed or clipped in. None of those horrid plastic poles that get melted to hold everything together. Back to the chassis now then, we need to rip apart the front end so we can start thinking about the mods. First, we can remove the four screws that attach the PCB and clip the wires for the rear lights and motor. Next, there's the four screws that hold the top panel that hold the front suspension in. Two at the back and two in line with the hubs. When the last screws come out, the front end collapses, so watch out for the small springs rolling away. They would be really easy to lose track of. The last big bit to come out is the steering motor. It's held in with two screws, but from the top it's a bit hard to tell which two screws. So I just removed all of them and pulled it out. We're not keeping it, so it really doesn't matter if it all falls apart. That just leaves the steering centering spring. It's a lot beefier than the ones you tend to find on toy RCs. There's a couple of metal plates held in with a screw. Very nice. We don't need any of it though, so we can just undo the screw and remove it. 
To remove the steering trim lever, we go to the bottom of the chassis and turn it 90 degrees so the clips line up with the slots and it will just drop out. Couldn't be easier. What we're left with is a fairly large open space to fit some proper steering. At least, it looks like a large space until you offer up a small servo. Suddenly, it feels like it's going to be a bit tight on space. We'll see though. Next time on this truck, we will be fitting a servo. No doubt with some 3D printed bits, along with the ESC and radio. It makes an interesting change to be making a video where we're taking something apart rather than building it. So, as always, thanks for watching, like if you liked, subscribe if you haven't, and leave a message if there's something on your mind. Bye guys!